Let's go before the Lord. Hebrews 10, says, Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Fanny Crosby wrote this prayer. If you know it, sing it with me. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told of love for me. And I long to rise on the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Let's just stay with that image for a few moments. Meditate on that picture. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you would Fill us with your love. We love you, God, but we desire to love you more. Father, we want to love Jesus the way you love Jesus. Give us your love and fill us with your love. And open the eyes of our heart that we may see and behold wondrous things from your word tonight. Mm -hmm. Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Lord Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, for we ask it in the name which is above every name. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. And hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor Jason, for uh, the opportunity to talk about prayer and for the Wednesday night. I, I told Beth, I said, this is bizarre. <laughs> this is bizarre on Wednesday night. Everything is so big and good. And uh, what you were talking about just now, the vastness of the universe and what God is doing. And we're invited by him to join him in what he's doing by praying. And that blows your mind. Um, quick review before we look at the material tonight. Uh, God's desire for us is to have fellowship with him. That's what prayer is all about. Now, we know that uh, things get done with prayer and God works, you know, through prayer and we ask God to do things. But we are not primarily a workforce. We're a family. <laughs> That's what we are. We have a Father that desires for us to know Him, to trust Him, to love Him, and serve Him in that order. Because you're really not going to serve with delight someone you don't love. Now, you can serve without loving. That's duty. And you can do it. And get a lot done. But uh, to serve the Lord with joy, with gladness, with delight is the result of loving Him. And you're not going to love someone you don't trust. And you're not going to trust someone you don't know. <laughs> Story number nine. A few, remember. <laughs> well, no, you couldn't remember because it didn't happen here. First week in Kingsland. Didn't know anybody, but I recognized a little red-headed girl about six, seven, maybe eight years old. She came running up to me. Pastor Bubba, she had something. She said, Pastor Bubba, I have something for you. I said, oh, thank you. I didn't even know her name, but I saw her. And she said, well, lean down. So I got like this. She said, I have a surprise for you. Okay. She said, close your eyes. Close my eyes. She said, now open your mouth. I opened my eyes. I said, no, I, what? What do you have? No, it's a surprise. I said, no, I don't know you. So why did I? Not trust her, because I didn't know her. 
Now, I got to know her, and I would trust her, but because she had chocolate every Sunday. She would give me that surprise. But uh, so you want to know. Jesus wants us to know the Father. That's what he revealed, the Father to us, so that we would know him and trust him and love him and serve him. That's what happens in fellowship with God in prayer. Prayer is a conversation with God. And we trust Him to set the conversation. That's why uh, uh, learning to pray by listening and watching Jesus in the Bible is essential. Now, I listen to people pray, and I listen to myself praying, and I learn from my dad, Dick Stahl, and but some of that was not in the Bible. And uh, uh, to learn to pray, you want to go to the Bible. And tonight we're going to watch and pray. That's what Jesus told his disciples in the garden. Watch and pray. And watch and listen to Jesus as he prays. Now again, another real quick review from last week. To learn to recognize God's voice in the Scripture. And to hear his voice. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And to be able to recognize the voice of God so that you can say it back to him what you hear him say. And that's so important. And a a lot of times, kind of like Simon Peter, you don't have a clue what that means. Simon Peter didn't when he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He didn't know what he said. He just heard it. And that passage in Matthew 16 is a passage about prayer because Jesus said, you're blessed, Simon, for saying back to God, that was to Jesus, what you just heard the Father say. And then Jesus went on, now that you know who the Messiah is, now the mission. And he said, we're going to Jerusalem, we're going to be betrayed, turned over, die, rise again. Remember what Peter said? No, you're not. So he didn't have a clue what he, was, what he was saying. But that's okay. You don't have to understand. Just say it back to God. And the understanding will come. We, by faith, we understand, Hebrews 11, 3 says. By faith, we understand. So say it back to God, and it's all by faith. Praying is the most elementary expression of faith. There is. It is obedience. When you pray, you are being obedient because you are responding to what God has said. Remember our little saying last week? I believe, you believe that what God has said is true. What God has said, He will do because He is faithful. And so when we pray back, what we hear him say, we're trusting. God's going to do it. That's why Jesus said in John, John 15, he says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. Now, of course, in his name doesn't mean that you just tack on in the name of Jesus at the end of the prayer. We do that. But in agreement with him, in agreement with him, praying in agreement with Jesus, what he has said. And we leave the timing and the way up to God. Okay, well, just some of the things reviewing from last week. So tonight I'd like for us to uh, do uh, one thing real quick and then two things in a little more in depth uh, and reading some scripture, watching and Jesus praying. The first section of this, first seven things is watching Jesus pray from the Gospel of Luke, the different scenes where you see Jesus pray. One of of Luke's emphasis was the prayer life of Jesus. Now, of course, the other Gospel writers also showed Jesus praying a lot, but Luke seems to emphasize it. Now, we're not going to go through these for the sake of time because I want to spend more time on the other two sections, but I do want to encourage you to Look at these seven, there's not, that's not all of them, but look at these seven scenes of Jesus praying. And similar to the way we did just a moment ago during our prayer time, one of the things that you can do in your prayer time is to meditate on 
one of those scenes. Just like the disciples who heard and saw Jesus praying, and as he came back from there, said, teach us to pray. Looking at Jesus praying in the Scripture will encourage you to listen to him teach you to pray. Amen. So, for example, the first one, Jesus is a 12-year-old boy in the temple and the house of prayer. And he is studying a prayer by sitting, listening to the teachers, asking them questions. Picture yourself on those southern steps watching him do that and meditate on that scene in your prayer time. Amen. And that's just one of seven. But So I've given you these scriptures to look at, but the purpose of that is to fix that scene in your mind and, and, and watch it in your prayer time. Now that's called, uh, the, called non-discursive praying. That's praying without saying anything. It's seeing something when you pray. Uh, some would call that uh, centering prayer or meditative prayer, contemplative prayer. It's without words, but it says a great deal to you from just looking at Jesus as he prays. But what I'd like for us to do tonight really is to spend time with the seven requests, actually six requests and a promise of Jesus in John 17 called the great high priestly prayer of Jesus. But he asked the Father for six things that only God can give and then makes a promise, which is kind of a, a veiled request. But we can join Jesus in praying those uh, six, uh, that, those seven things, if we will learn them. Now, learning to pray what only God can do, that's one of the, th that's an important thing. That, uh, there's uh, several things. Pastor Jason, I remember you were teaching on the, um, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and you identified that that's a passive imperative, be filled uh, pa in other words, imperative, it's a command, but it's imperative. You must be, but you can't do that on your own. It's passive. It's passive tense. Only God can fill you. Amen. But we ask him to. We ask him to do what only he can do. Only God can save a person, but we ask him to save people. We ask him to save us. Only God can transform your mind and make you holy only God can enlighten the eyes of you. There's several things that only God can do, and we ask him to do that. Well, you see uh, seven of these in this John 17 prayer. Now, along with that, as we'll see in, in the next section, there's also things that only you can do that God won't do. Uh, for example, well, let me ask you, what would that be? Don't answer, Pastor. <laughs> I know it's a temptation. I feel that every... Well, okay, what, what, does, what does God wait for you to do? Pray. Yeah, pray is one. Uh, how about repent? Now, God gives you the spirit of repentance, which, by the way, it's devastating. That gift is devastating. But still... Only you can repent. Only you can walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. That's kind of repentance. Uh, only you can think of these things which are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Think on these things, things that are true, things that are noble, things that are right. Only you can choose to think on uh, those things. Well, that's, that, that can build your whole prayer asking God to do what only he can do, and then making the promise and the commitment to do what only you can do in your prayer. That's kind of what we're going to look at tonight. Someone read John 17, 1 through 3. Here's the first request that we can join Jesus in praying. Who will read those three verses? John 17, 1 through 3.
Amen. Now, there's 26 verses in this chapter, but there's only seven requests. Most of this prayer is confessional. And when you learn to pray from Scripture, you'll, your prayer will begin to take that shape. Now, certainly we have our prayer list, and we'll talk about a prayer list and journal uh, next time, God willing. But uh, learning to pray from the Scripture, you, you have more confession than you have request. Now, confession is not necessarily confessing your sin. It is that. Most of all, it's confessing the truth. Agreeing, Agreeing with God and what He has said is real. And you'll see this in Jesus' prayer. It mirrors the book of Psalms, and particularly Psalm 119, that we'll try to get into next, next week as well. But the first request is for what? Father, glorify your Son so that your Son may glorify you. So what does that look like in your prayer time when you join Jesus in that request? I've given you some suggestions in the little booklet there, but here's how it sounds. Father, glorify your Son in me, so that your Son in me will glorify you. Now the so that in prayer, and you'll see this not in all of the requests in John 17, but, but several, the so that is the result of the prayer. And that's so important to learn. Asking God for something with this result. It's kind of like the answer to the prayer. Asking God for this, and He's already given you the answer, the outcome, so that, glorify your Son, so that, can you see that? So that your Son will glorify you. Amen. And you join Jesus in that prayer. Isn't that something that you want to ask God for? Oh, don't say no. <laughs> yes, it is. But so that, glorify your Son in me, so that your Son in me will glorify you. Let's look at the next one, down in verse 11 and 12. Someone read those two verses. Now, there's a lot of confession in between. But here comes the next request, verse 11 and 12. Who will read that? I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Amen. There's another so that. Did you hear it? Uh, protect them. That's a good translation. Keep them in your name. Now, he's primarily speaking of the apostles, uh, but he includes us at the end of the prayer with the apostles. But probably this is not something that you have prayed <laughs> in your personal prayer time. Father, keep me in your name. What name? The name that you gave Jesus. The name which is above every name. So that I can be one with other believers in that name. Oh, what a prayer request. You say, well, I don't think that's even possible. It is because Jesus asked the Father for it. Keep them in your name. Now, of course, we're talking about personal prayer time. That's primarily what we're talking about. But we also pray corporately, and Jesus told us to our Father, and give us, and we, and, and that's, of course, you, you can't think of all believers. That, I, I think about my family and the people on my prayer list when I say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Give us this day. I'm thinking about particular people. That's the best way I can do it. I know it involves all believers. But keep us, Father, in your name. I'm thinking about my family, myself, my family, and everybody on my prayer list. It's not very long, really. But uh, manageable. But, uh, but the individuals, so that we might be one. Now, this, this mutual indwelling, this oneness, is a, uh, I guess it's very... Uh, simple and yet very profound. 
as Jesus talks in these, these five chapters of John, 13 through 17, how he is in the Father and the Father is in him and he is in us and we are in him, that mutual indwelling. Uh, uh, this, the simple uh, cowboy <laughs> mind <laughs> that, you know, Jason, Pastor Jason talks about his engineering mind. I can't even spell that word. I, I wouldn't even be able to fill out the 101 and wherever. It's agreement. Oneness is agreement. When you're in agreement with someone in, in, in Scripture, you are one with them. You're in agreement. You're walking the same direction. And so being kept in his name. Let's go on to the next one. Go to uh, C. Someone read the third thing that Jesus prayed, verse 15 and 16. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Oh, that's huge. And of course, when you uh, are born from above, you have a spiritual experience. You are no longer of this world. You enter a different world. You enter a spiritual world. And uh, Jesus came from above. And when you are born from above... You enter that world. And so here's the third request. Keep them from the devil. Keep them from the devil. I put in there the world, the flesh, and the devil. The unholy trinity. Not the world, not a people, but the world order. What falls in Revelation 18, Babylon, that rides the beast, good grief, and controls and the flesh, we're all familiar with the flesh, my, that sin that dwells in me. That seems like it almost has a, a mind of its own. It's, it's the spirit. It's the spirit. Good grief. It's always there. And, uh, and, of course, the devil. We've all done business. We know that one. But to keep you from, and we pray that. Of course, Jesus had that in his prayer. Lead us not into temptation told his disciples, pray that you don't enter temptation. So you can join Jesus in that prayer. Lord Jesus, keep me from the world, the flesh, and the devil. The lies. Reveal to me the lies that I have believed. Good grief. I didn't even know it was a lie until you showed me. Let's go to number D. Someone read verse, uh, chapter 17, verse 17 and 19. These are prayer requests of Jesus that you learn and join him in praying. Pray with Jesus for what he prayed for you. Amen. Someone read verse 17 and 19. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Amen. Sanctified, of course, means to be made holy. Um, I like to pray this one by saying, make me holy like you did the seventh day. You know, how did God make the seventh day holy? He just said, this day is now holy. <laughs> it's the first thing in creation that was called holy. And it has a totally different purpose now than the other six days. Give, giving meaning to the other six days. Jesus prayed that we would be made holy by the word, by the truth. Father, your word is truth. And you learn that request, and when you pray it, you are joining Jesus in that prayer. Good grief for crying out loud. <laughs> Let's go to E. Someone read verse 20 and 23. A big request. We've seen part of it before, but look at the fullness. 20 through 23. Someone read the scripture. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Sent 
I guess I just get, you get tired of hearing me say good grief, but good grief. What a prayer request. And the result of it, this mutual indwelling of, of being one with the Father and the Son by the Holy Spirit so that the world might know that you sent me. Now, of course, John's gospel uses that word sent for the whole circle. Coming, you know that song we would sing? I don't know the signs, but from heaven above. fruit. I'm already, oh, forget it. <laughs> the, to earth to show the way. All the way back to heaven. That whole thing is in that little word sent. The, uh, the, Birth, life, teaching, uh, death, burial, resurrection, ascension. That's all in that word sent. We're just talking about the gospel. How can we get the word out? We're praying now as the challenge, thank you, for, for a passion for lost people that we would see what the Holy Spirit sees and feel what He feels and love what He loves, which are those whom God created in His image, the people of the world. But how will they know? Jesus has told us by the love that we love one another with. By this, all men will know what being my disciple looks like and that Unity, that mutual indwelling in the Father, in the Son, by the Spirit, together. I mean, the Bible ends with that in Revelation two times. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. That, that, that end time church will have it. Now, right now, we are like we've heard in, we are the Laodicean group. And I keep hearing people talking, oh, well, the rapture, maybe tonight. I hope the rapture. I'm wondering if we get spewed back out right now. <laughs> because there's not that mutual indwelling among believers, but there will be. There will be. And the Bible describes, Jesus describes the greatest revival that the world has ever seen in that end time church. I'm thinking about three or four billion believers before Jesus comes back. And why? Because the Spirit and the bride will have such unity that there's one message. Come. Come. Come to Christ. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Come. So this prayer request is huge. And we incorporate it in our prayer time. Learning this uh, prayer... <laughs> Oh, there's so many stories I'll not tell. <laughs> but uh, I want to get through this material tonight. Join Jesus in praying for that mutual indwelling so that the revival that we pray for will happen. Our problem is we pray for the result rather than the request. And we wonder, why isn't it happening? We're not praying God's way. Ask me for this so that the answer will come, so that the result will follow. You keep asking me for the result without the request. <laughs> Why would God give us revival with the kind of divisiveness we have? Which really surfaced March of 2020, didn't it? Good grief, within church families, within families. And the, the virus did not create divisiveness. It surfaced it so that we could see we know what to pray for. Why would God send a bunch of new believers into that <laughs> so that they could learn divisiveness? Well, I'm kind of getting off. Let's get, let's get back. Learn this prayer request. Huge. How about the sixth one? Take a look at this one. 
verse 24. Well, of course, you wouldn't expect anything less from Jesus than huge. <laughs> but I wonder if, and I know there's folks in the nursing homes, and like my mother's 96 that prays for this every night. Lord Jesus, I want to be with you. <laughs> I want to be with you. But do you pray that in your regular prayer time? Lord, I want to be with you. He prayed for you to be with him. Now and forever. And here, for, for what? To see His glory. And what is that? Well, it's real bright. <laughs> we know that. You can't miss it. It's, it's, it'll light up all of eternity, creation. One day there will be no sun, no moon, uh, no other light, no lamp, no temple. We, we're, okay, well that's... The last chapters. It's God's love. You dig into that John 14 through 17 enough and you're going to hit gold to see that when Jesus refers to His glory that He has given us, what is it? The love that God loves God with. That's what it is. Is there anything greater than that? No. The love that the Father loves the Son with and the Son loves the Father with. He has given us His love. John 15, 9. As the Father loves me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Live in it. And what will happen? He will be glorified. Wow. Well, it's exciting. Nobody's wearing a hat, but if you dare, you would you throw it in the air about now. It's exciting. <laughs> But I wonder if you're willing to learn to pray with Jesus for what he's praying for you for. And you can. The last one is a promise. Uh, read that last verse. Read verse 26. got to be King James. Thank you. <laughs> Remember when we all had a King James Bible and a Baptist hymnal? You could go to any Baptist church in the world and those two things. Well, okay. We've made improvements, but I like to hear it still. I've made known your name, and here comes the promise. And I will continue to make it known. That's a promise. Jesus is making a promise to the Father. Father, I've made known your name, and I will continue. I will. It's a promise. I will continue to make it known so that, here comes a, request, here comes a result, so that the love that you love me with will be in them and I in them. <laughs> wow. So... Here's these seven requests. The last one is a promise. Now, we're going to look at the seven promises now that Jesus promises us for us to pray from John 14 through 16 concerning the Holy Spirit. It's a promise. He's making promises to us for us uh, to pray. But here's one of the things I get pushback, or I have gotten pushback over the years on, and that is learning to pray from the Scripture, you will learn to make promises to God when you pray. Now, here's the, uh, the response or reaction I've gotten from folks that will be honest with me and say, no, I'm not doing that. I said, why? And why, why are we hesitant to make a promise to God? Break might, might break it. Yeah, we might not keep it. Okay. I wonder if you'll hear that at the next wedding. Minister there, two people. Okay, are you ready to make your vows to one another? And the groom said, what? <laughs> You're going to make a promise to your bride. 
oh, no, no, I might not keep it. Well, let's just go to the reception then because this isn't happening. <laughs> Nobody says that at a wedding. And we're in a covenant relationship with God, right? We certainly like His promises to us, and we learn to pray them. Pray the promises of God. Pray this promise of God. Lord Jesus, reveal to me the Father's name. I know you have, but show me more. Show me more so that your love will grow in me more. More love for the Father. More love for the Spirit. More love for what you love. And, and so the promises, well, you, learn, you will learn to pray the promises. But here's the deal about the promises. You, when you make your promise, learn from the Scripture what the promises are. Because remember Jephthah in the Old Testament? The judges, he made a rash vow. Remember that one? And it uh, didn't work out so well for his daughter, his only daughter. So you don't just come up with a promise, say, okay, I promise. No, learn the promises that God has given you to pray, and when you make that promise to God, make sure you do that in your prayer time. You're in a covenant relationship with God. He's promised you, but when you do, make sure that you tag on John 15, you know, 5. Without you, Lord, I can do nothing. <laughs> only you can make that happen. I'm going to abide in you, which is another thing that only you can do, abide in Christ. His word, abide in you. You abide in him. Ask he will do it. The promises that you make are really veiled requests because you can't keep that promise unless God gives you His faithfulness. He who calls you, 1 Thessalonians 5, the prayer you learn, He who calls you is faithful, He will do it. Now who gets the glory when He does it? He does. What do you get? Joy and strength. The joy of being included in what God's doing and seeing His glory, His love shine brighter and brighter. Okay, so the seven promises that Jesus makes concerning the Holy Spirit. Now, the context is so important. John 13, betrayal. Uh, denial, big vow. You're not going away. I'm going with you. I'll die for you. Remember Peter saying that? What did Jesus say? No, Peter, you're not. You're going to deny me three times before the sun comes up. Peter kind of shut up after that. He didn't say <laughs> anything after that. But how do you overcome that? How do you, how, how do you overcome that kind of Betrayal, that kind of disappointment, that kind of failure by what Jesus said in John 14, 1. Don't let your hearts stay troubled over this. You believe in God, believe also in me. Faith. In my Father's house. That's how Jesus talked about death. I'm going to my Father. I'm going to the Father's house. There is a lot of place to live. That's the word mansion, dwelling place, a place to live. And I'm going there to make a place for you to live so that where I am there, you can be also. And so Jesus was telling them that he's going away. I'm sure the disciples say, hey, we just got here. We're just getting started. And some more miracles would be awesome to... <laughs> Get, a, get the crowds back. They kind of dwindled because you were saying this eat my flesh thing. and it's just, Don't go back there. <laughs> Which, by the way, is mutual indwelling with Christ. Eating His words. It's what the Lord's Supper is all about. A reminder of that the word of Jesus is inseparable from the incarnation. His body his blood that was given, that whole thing. Okay, back to going away, going away. But there's going to be another 
helper. I've helped you. There's another helper. And this is so much review because Pastor Jason and Daniel and all of them, they've just gone over this so much, but you can't, you can't get enough of it. Look at John 14. Someone read 15 through 18 because you want to learn to pray this. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Amen. So what does Jesus promise? He promises that the Holy Spirit is coming. He will be with them because he will live in them forever. And he, Jesus, he says, I'm not leaving you as orphans. In other words, he's going to provide for you just like I have provided for you since the day you started following me. Think of all that Jesus provided for his disciples during those three years or so. I mean, so much. And so this is a promise of Jesus concerning what you and I have. But I wonder if you pray much about it. You know, when you study, and we'll touch on them maybe, the, the prayers of Paul... In Ephesians, there's two, one in Philippians, one in Colossians. You'll notice that he is asking, you'll notice that he does not ask for something that they don't already have. He's asking for them to access what's already been given. Now, a lot of our prayers, we ask for things we don't have. Oh, I need this. I need that. When you learn to pray from the Bible, you will learn to ask for what's already been given. <laughs> In my mind, I'm jumping a back flip, but my mind is giving checks my body can't cash anymore. I can't do that anymore. No, that's exciting to think about, that, that, that we are asking the Holy Spirit to live in me. And think about what that means. Live. In me. Why am I asking? Because Jesus promised it. I'm asking for what Jesus promised the Holy Spirit would do. What would he do? Live in me. <laughs> and provide. Like a child, we're a family. Look at the next one. Next promise. B. Number three, B. Someone read verse 26, chapter 14. Amen. He's your teacher. Teach me. Holy Spirit, today, teach me. Teach me what? Well, bring to my memory what Jesus said. Everything. Teach me all things. Now, of course, the Lord will only teach you what you can handle. <laughs> but, but he is giving you spiritual growth, which is another thing that only God can give. Deal bountifully with your servant, Lord, that I may live and keep your word. Psalm 119, verse I don't know, 20 maybe, I don't know. That word deal bountifully literally means to be weaned, to become mature, to go from milk to solid food. That's like a child does. Deal bountifully. And so the Holy Spirit as your teacher is maturing you. And it is based upon the word of Jesus Christ. He is the word. Let's keep rolling. See, what's the next thing that Jesus promised? The end of chapter 15. Verse, someone read 26, 27. And the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, who will testify about me. Amen. And? Yeah, be my witness. He will witness. He will bear witness of me, and you will bear witness of me. Of course, we're learning in the book of Acts. 
You will be my witnesses, Jesus said. You will be my witness. Sometimes we think about witnessing, but being a witness. That doesn't necessarily mean you go through the four spiritual laws with everybody you come across. It could, but mainly it's revealing the reality of Jesus Christ. That's bearing witness. The Holy Spirit does that in you first, with you next, through you after that, <laughs> before the Father and the watching and listening world around you. We want to run out and be His witness and go witnessing without asking Him to bear witness of Him first. And when we're doing that, you know what we're witnessing? You know what we're sharing? Ah, we're sharing day old manna. We're, we're, we're not sharing that what the Holy Spirit is sharing with us. Oh, that's where it's at. Let's keep going. So, but this is a promise, and you pray that. Holy Spirit, today bear witness of Christ in me, with me, through me, wherever I go. Before the Father, it's for Him and the watching world, whoever happens to be around. And nobody has to be around. Oh, I'm going to take the time to tell this story. So the old guy in the, there in the northwest, the Lord, pastor, pastor told, uh, the Lord told him, go up to that mining camp. This is just an old story, but I love it. Go up to the, mine, do, the, loggers, uh, the logger camp. The loggers are up there and preach the gospel. Ah, no, Lord, it's a long way. Those loggers are tough. They, they, they'd beat me up and kill me. No, go, go. He knew what he was supposed to do. His wife said, don't do it. No, I'm going to do it. I've got to. The Lord told me, go up there. I know where it is. Took him a whole day to get there. When he got there, it was abandoned. Nobody was there. They'd moved on to another location. There was just the big dining hall and nothing else was there. He said, well, I don't know where they went. But the Lord told me to come here and to preach the gospel. So he just preached the gospel. He just preached a sermon. Kind of like we did during the lockdown, just in front of nobody. <laughs> I don't know if the camera's working or not. I'm just going to preach. <laughs> so he just preached. What he didn't know was what they sent one of the men back to get some stuff. He came back. He heard somebody talking. He sat outside, heard the gospel, got saved, and then went back and became the preacher to the loggers. They listened to him. You say, well, how do you know that story? Because it was a revival among the loggers, and there was the testimony. I didn't even know who it was, but I just sat there and heard the guy yelling about Jesus. You don't, you don't know who's watching and who's listening as you sing, uh, as you uh, go over your memory verse. I loved wearing a mask because I could go over my memory verse without looking like I was talking to myself. <laughs> Went right away. Because people look and say, what is he doing? He's talking to himself. Or you can wear those things now. They say, oh, he's talking on the phone. Bear witness. Let's keep going. Next one, verse, chapter 16, verse 7. So this is kind of a big one, but one you're familiar with. He will convict the world, the Holy Spirit, when he comes. He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and the judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to the Father. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is is judged. This is the message that the world is to hear from us if we're asking the Holy Spirit to <laughs> preach that message. Sin is not disobedience. That's the other religions of the world. The theology of sin in Islam, in Judaism, and even in Buddhism, all the world is disobedience. Guess what righteousness is in that, in that uh, understanding? Obedience. We don't have that. We're the only faith that sin is unbelief. It leads to disobedience. It's <laughs> connected. But it starts with unbelief. Jesus said so, right? The Holy Spirit is going to convict the world of sin because they don't believe in me. When you understand that sin is unbelief, guess what righteousness is? Belief is faith. 
So of sin, because they don't believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to the Father. Sent. Think of that song. He's in heaven above to get the earth below. Back up. That is righteousness. The, what P- Pastor Jason was talking about in there, about, uh, about heaven and, and Jesus going back there, making all things new. His rightness with the Father, which He has given for whosoever will come. And the ruler of this world is judged. That's the outcome. So that message, I just call it praying for the message of the Holy Spirit. One, to make sure that I'm in agreement with that message. Do I agree with that? Let's keep going. Oh, yeah. Take a look at um, F. Uh, Excuse me, E. He will guide you into all truth. Go ahead and somebody read verse 12 and the first part of verse 13. Chapter 16, 12 and the first part of 13. Yeah, he will, his guidance, his leadership. Praying for the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Of course, Jesus ties this with being made holy. Sanctification, we know that. He will guide you into all truth. Because he will, we're getting into the next one. He will not speak on his own. He will speak what he hears. Someone read the next one. He will, the, 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 ver, the second part of verse 13 Yeah, now this is misunderstood. A lot of people think, oh, this is like the like prophecy. Like sometimes you read in the news, I saw a headline about Nostradamus or, you know, he's predicting, predicting, and all is okay. That's not what the Holy Spirit does. He's not going to tell you what stock is going to be up next week. A lot of people want that. What is he, what is he doing when he tells you of things to come? I tell you what it is. He's reminding you of God's promises. We need reminder of that. Because what God has said, He will do. Because He is faithful. And so this role of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is promising, that we join Jesus in praying for, Holy Spirit, remind me of your promises, the promises of the Father. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by that word that God has promised. And I believe that's true and it's going to happen. That's going to happen in God's timing and in God's way. But I can ask the Father for a revelation of things to come. Now this also includes the last five chapters of the book of Revelation. The, the biblical worldview, a worldview answers four questions. What's our purpose? Where do we come from? What's our purpose? What's the problem? What's the solution? In other words, what's the outcome? All worldviews ask the same question. Okay, so where do we come from? God. Now, what's our purpose? To glorify Him. What's the problem in our sin? What's the solution? Salvation. That includes the return of Jesus Christ. And beloved, This is required for an overcoming faith that we're going to need as the days get darker and darker and darker and our faith gets stronger and stronger and stronger to overcome. (laughs) Not to be complaining, oh, we can't go anywhere anymore. No, not complaining, but rejoicing because the revival is happening at the same time. And that overcoming, victorious faith requires a clear view of where we're headed. I'm oh, sorry to be so loud. <laughs> I'm trying to not be so loud. Let's get to the last one because this is just an exclamation mark on it all. Someone read verse 14 and 15 of the role of the Holy Spirit. I love this one. Amen. 
<laughs> One translation, he will declare. He will declare to you. He will take from what is mine and declare it to you. And when you're praying this, you're asking the Holy Spirit to speak Christ in you. To speak the things that are Christ in you. Because when He does, He is speaking it in you, with you, through you, as you, before the Father and the watching world around you. And beloved, he has given us this so that we will ask Him. Psalm 2, the Father, God is speaking to the Son, the King, ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. If God wants to bless us with all this, why doesn't He just do it? He can. Why won't He? The same reason he told Jesus in, John, in Psalm 2, ask of me. He wants fellowship with us. He wants us to know him by knowing what he wants to do. And when we do, we're changed by that. Every blessing that comes when we say, thank you, Father, understand that you're also saying in that, and change me to become that blessing. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those. That's the promise in that prayer. I will forgive. How can I forgive? Because being forgiven, that blessing, the greatest blessing of all, changes me to become that. <laughs> and that bears witness of Christ. Well, I didn't think I could do it. It'll go through 14 things with you. Actually, 21 but here's your homework. Learn one scene from the life of Jesus. Any one you want to. It doesn't have to be in chronological order. It could be the one in the Garden of Gethsemane or on the cross. There, Jesus is praying. There's a boy. Transition times. Mount of Transfiguration. Get that scene in your mind like a picture. And just look at it. Just look at it and spend time just looking at it. Watch and pray. And you're looking at Jesus praying when you do. So that's Simon number one. Simon number two, learn the request of Jesus in John 17, one through three. Remember it? Father, glorify your son in me. That your son in me will glorify you. Pray that one. Pray one promise. Jesus, you promised to give the Holy Spirit to me and, I, and He lives in me. Live in me, Holy Spirit. Provide everything because you are my Father. Pray that scene, that request, that promise. I do it for seven days. No, oh, no. Do it for a month. You'll have it memorized by then. Include that in your prayer time. Joining Jesus by watching Him pray. Picture that. Just, just look at it. Non-discursive prayer. Pray the request that He prayed, John 17. Pray the promise of the Holy Spirit. His work in you. Ask Him to do it. Because He has promised to do it if we'll ask Him to. Then, next month, go to the second scene, the second request, the second promise. That's the way to, uh, to learn those requests, those promises, those scenes of Jesus. Okay, you got it? How about a question before we go? Can we go in a with a question? So, yes, sir. R John? Uh, yeah, come. A little story about the redhead. Girl that was, <laughs> was that a hot pepper or was that a piece of candy? No, no. No, it was a piece of, it was a piece of chocolate. Yeah, I still didn't trust her for a while. That was the red hair, I think. I don't know. It's, uh, I don't think that was it. But, uh, but she was very reliable with a piece of uh, chocolate every Sunday. And, but I still, I, you know, okay. Another question before we depart. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Pastor. All right, you good? Thank you for being here. Let's learn to pray. 
Let's learn to pray from the scripture. It's an eternal. We will always, forever, be learning as we converse with God. Next week, we'll talk about some other uh, practical things about prayer journal and all that stuff. Well, thank you, Bubba. You guys give him a hand. He's working hard to keep to keep you excited. I love it. I love it. Well, let's let's pray and then we're done. Our heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your Son that you have taught us to pray. Father, forgive us uh, when we fall short of of doing the simple things and meditating on your word and and looking and learning uh, from your word how to pray, um, and and then. And then believing your promises and, and praying it back to you. Father, teach us to do this. Um, teach, teach us to comb through your word. What an incredible example right here uh, in John, uh, John 17 and, and these, these promises. And uh, God, teach us to do this and to, to revitalize our prayer life, God, because we're praying your promises uh, back to you. And we are believing you at your word. Um, and God, we are, we are knowing your heart. Um, and so uh, we want to walk in that truth. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.